Um, welcome, thanks for joining us today. Uh, in this webinar, we're looking at the uh, policy paper Planning for the Future, which was published on the 12th of March of this year. Um, and that foreshadows a full planning white paper. Who knows when that's going to be published? Um, but we're here to speculate on what changes we can expect to see uh, coming through in the planning system from that policy paper and the white paper. So we plan to speak for around 35 minutes. We're then going to have a question and answer session at the end. Um, we've had some questions in advance from participants, so thank you very much for those. Um, we'll try to cover as many of those in the talk as we go along. You can use the question and answer function though on the Zoom control panel uh, while the presentation is taking place. And we'll try and cover those um, at the end. And you can always follow up with us afterwards if we're not able to get to your question. Uh, as you will have seen, the slides and recording will be available on the website soon. And we'll email a link um, to all participants with those uh, after this talk. So um, this is what we're going to cover. We pick what we think are the most important or interesting topics in the policy paper. Joe's going to kick off with what the paper says about reform of the planning system um, and then move on to the key matter of housing, supply, delivery and demand. And then I'm going to look at what the uh, policy paper says about zoning and about design. And then finally, I'll speculate on what impact coronavirus might have on the forthcoming white paper. So I'll pass over to Joe now to get us started. Thanks, Emma, and hello, everybody. And thank you for being so kind about um, my confessing to being nervous about the webinar. This is actually my first um, post-coronavirus lockdown webinar, and first things always make everybody nervous, don't they? But um, thank you for your kind messages, a couple of you who heard us admitting to that before we started. Um, OK, so can I have the first slide? Emma's going to be in charge of the slides, so I'm going to talk, and she's going to hopefully um, bring the slides along um, such that they match more or less what, what I'm saying. Um, th those of you that heard me speak before will know that I'm obsessed with uh, GIFs. So there's your, your first one. This is um, just really about the context of um, this policy paper. Um, remembering, and we're going to come back to this a few times in the course of um, today, uh, that all of this came before we really knew that coronavirus was coming and that there would be a lockdown and, and so on and so forth. So um, obviously that's also part of the context, but the policy paper itself says at paragraph six that um, basically the world has been transformed since the 1947 Act, which as you know was the first act to kind of regulate or seriously regulate at national level town and country planning. Um, the planning process has failed to keep pace, it's complex, outdated and fails to deliver enough homes where they're needed. Well, as Emma said, I'm going to talk about homes in a little while, but the policy paper is basically saying we're going to change this. Um, a couple of points on, on that. Slightly odd to refer to the 1947 Act rather than anything else. Of course, we deal with the 1990 Act, and I think what they're really saying is that it's that Act that's out of date. I mean, obviously, the 1947 Act is... Um, and secondly, uh, one of the questions raised actually wasn't the NPPF supposed to do exactly what they're now saying they need to do again, which is bring the planning process or system up to date and speed it up and stop it being anachronistic and so on. I, I, I agree with the rhetorical nature of that question. Yeah, yeah, I think the NPPF was supposed to do that. Um, but, but here we go again. And of course, the NPPF was updated not really very long ago. Um, but, but there we are. Okay, next slide. Well, that little GIF cranks into action. Um, paragraph 13 of the paper has as one of its headings, um, speeding up the planning system. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what's suggested under that heading. Um, again, a few of you have asked questions and th thanks again for the in advance questions ab about this um, proposal about fees structure. And basically the policy paper, as is normal, is fairly vague about what it says, but in effect the implication is uh, the fees structure, so what you pay when you make a planning application, is going to be amended such that the implication is the fees are going to be considerably higher, such that local authorities are um, better resourced to deal with the planning process. Um, but um, that, that will be linked to, says the paper, 
a performance framework. Now, we know that some local authorities have done that off their own bat to a certain extent and sought to set up um, a sort of semi-contractual basis for charging fees. So certain things that they will promise to do if they um, get the fees that they want and so on. It sounds as if that's going to be uh, formalised. Um, so the good news is um, more money coming to local authorities. Good news if you're a local authority. And to some extent, if you're somebody who has to deal with the local authorities, the idea is more money might get things done a bit more efficiently or quickly. That's certainly the government's um, aspiration. But there's a fairly big but that comes immediately afterwards. Um, again, I don't know whether my gif will work here. The, the Lord giveth and the Lord get, taketh away. Um, the policy paper goes on to say, or float the idea, that um, application fees, these new enhanced application fees, might then be repayable uh, if the decision is overturned on appeal. Now, um, again, a couple of questions that came from you in advance of today. Um, Philippa Jarvis, hello, Philippa, um, making what I think is a, is a good point, which is to some extent we already have the costs regime. So where a decision is um, unreasonable or whether a refusal was unreasonable and can be shown to be unreasonable on appeal, then there's already a mechanism for recovering the costs of having to go to appeal. Slightly different point, but um, in effect, noting that wrong decisions might be met by some kind of payment. Um, and I agree that um, this might have the effect of making local authorities a bit more defensive at the application stage if they're worried that these new enhanced fees will be clawed back and taken away if a year or so down the line at an inquiry an inspector takes a different view. Um, of course the other point is that lots can change can't it between the decision of a, a committee and the decision of an inspector on an inquiry a year later so query how um, helpful it will be to know that if an inspector takes a different view on a relatively different scheme or at least a scheme evidenced by, by new evidence that you will lose all of these enhanced fees that are supposed to um, make the system uh, better and, and more efficient so um, I think a mixed bag uh, there. Let's get rid of those fish and move on to the next slide which is as some of you will know my own personal obsession which is what um, uh, is being said about housing land supply. Um, that's a picture of, did anyone watch the BBC programme The Nest? It, I, I, you can't answer but um, I'm assuming that some people are virtually nodding. That's the house. Um, it was a pretty amazing house so when I thought about housing I thought let's find out where that is. It's in Helensborough on Loch Long on the west coast of Scotland um, and you can rent it and stay in it. It's lovely. Anyway, um, the policy paper doesn't say anything about uh, BBC drama The Nest or that house um, but it does say uh, that there is basically a three-pronged uh, approach to um, the, the sort of national obsession with providing uh, more housing. So if you like the three parts of the pipeline, supply of sites, uh, delivery of units on sites, and then uh, demand, they're not always in that order, but that's the um, order in which they're dealt with in the paper. Um, so dealing with the uh, first one, that's the next slide, and then you can go straight on to the next slide, Emma, thank you. Uh, supply side of things, um, slightly terrifying, another review of the standard method for calculating local housing need. Um, a new approach, it says, I think that sounds like a Star Wars uh, film, doesn't it, another one in the franchise. Um, we, we've had a couple of... Uh, tweaks to the standard method already um, but what's promised here is uh, and I'm going to just speculate here because it's very difficult to know what it means a, a new approach which uh, emphasizes or, or permits or encourages greater building within and near urban areas. Now my feeling is that that might be a hint that the government is preparing to abandon the um, household projections as its starting point because at the moment the standard method doesn't really apart from area by area have anything to say about spatial um, placing of, of homes where within local authority areas homes might go or, or, or homes might be needed um, and within and near urban areas well that applies to an awful lot of local authorities so I wonder if that's just a hint that there's a departure from the household projections and I'm sort of 
to some extent supported in that by some of you will know the subnational population projections SNPP 2018 based came out last month um, which again showed a, a, a lower or suggested a lower national population than does the 2014 based household projections which are what the standard method is currently based on now the 2018 SNPP is what the 2018 based household projections which will come out later in the year are based on in population terms so again um, the latest population projections and therefore household projections will suggest slower growth in, in household formation than does the 2014 you remember that the government abandoned the 2016 based household projections because they didn't show a high enough rate of growth and therefore the standard method wouldn't do what it was wanted to do which is get us towards 300,000 homes a year so um, that sort of answers um, Edward Kemer's pop point in his question will it derail local plans the new SNPP well maybe um, but it, it, I wonder what the new standard method this new approach will will say about that certainly it seems to me that there's a hint that there might be a move away uh, from household projections as a basis and, and to something a bit more spatial, but I don't know what. Um, next slide, please, um, number two. Um, also on increasing supply, there are, there are warm words, not much more, I'm afraid, um, but warm words about self-build and supporting self-build and also for the Oxford-Cambridgeshire arc. Um, Ian Dunsford asked a question about uh, joint spatial planning. I think this is all there is in the in the policy paper about joint spatial planning is the suggestion of a um, spatial plan to 2050 for the Oxcam arc, not much else, um, and also uh, something about green and environmentally friendly building there. Um, somebody else asked about climate change, I think Emma's going to deal with that later. Um, warm words is about as far as it goes, very vague, um, but we might expect to see something in the white paper about encouraging um, self-build at least okay next slide please number three um the the uh, third uh, bit about uh, increasing supply so the first of poseidon's trident uh, there'll be a new emphasis again i always feel a bit suspicious when i hear about new emphasis because i think we've had an emphasis on brownfield land for quite a long time but um 400 million pounds pledged so so just a, a general warning whenever there's a figure money figure in this talk um there's a heavy caveat that um the the world has changed completely in particular government budgetary considerations have changed completely since this all was said um so 400 million to encourage more use of brownfield land um and there's going to be a national brownfield map uh, created um which sounds a bit like the brownfield register to me but perhaps not and then um Building above stations is the uh, new idea. Um, just had a message to say that it's breaking up a bit, but I, don't, I hope I'm not breaking up. I can't see Emma. I'll, I'll keep going, but I think Emma has dropped out, but sh she's not on for a little bit now, so I'll, I'll keep blaring on for the time being. Um, so yeah, N National Brownfield uh, map. Um, is she coming back? You've lost the slides, I think, probably. Let's see if we can. Here we go, slides are coming back. Just the slides, thank you very much, everybody. Um, <laughs> thank you, Sarah, for saying I sound very clear. That's good, <laughs> good news. I hope you mean generally rather than just the sound, but um, that's good. I think the slides are coming back. It looks like Emma's busy working on it. Um, I, will, I will continue with my thing about building above station. So, so I think the new idea links to the idea that people should live, um, more people should live in the places that are close to public transport. Um, there's going to be a drive, we don't know quite how, um, towards um, 
new residential development around and even above um, public transport interchanges and, and stations. So um, that's the third one. Um, there's, a, there's a fourth one which comes with a slide, but I think at the moment we haven't got the slides. Um, so I'll, I'll just keep talking, which is that the government says that this was a new one on me, uh, the word densify, which I hadn't heard before. Um, it's actually a feeling, it sort of describes quite well a feeling I have about myself, which as I get older, I seem to get denser. But anyway, the, the government have decided that densifying is what we're going to do. Um, in particular, um, again, this is the building above stations point, so we can increase the density of uh, residential development on land by building above uh, stations. Um, the paper says that the government are going to call for proposals on how to achieve um, more residential development above uh, stations. Uh, and then there's a suggestion of a couple of new lots of permitted development rights. Um, again, these are just proposals and consultations. Um, first of all, about whether you uh, permitted development rights should extend to adding up to two storeys on residential blocks. So in effect, would, it, would you have deemed planning permission to do that? And then secondly, this is about as vague as these things get, delivering new and bigger homes. I'm not quite sure what that means, whether you get permission for a four bedroom house, permitted development means you can buy uh, build a five bedroom house. I don't know, but it says they're going to um, look for proposals on that. Um, and then slightly more uh, clear, the suggestion that there might be permitted development rights to demolish uh, vacant industrial and residential blocks and, and build new residential schemes in their place. A bit of an echo of the permitted development right for changing office use to residential, which has actually caused uh, quite a lot of problems in the sphere of noise and so on. The building's not really being fit for purpose. Um, the idea here is um, that if these blocks are unused, we could build rather than reuse them as residential, convert them, you can knock them down and start again. I think that's a tacit acknowledgement that reusing office blocks for residential hasn't been very helpful. Um, sounds like we're still having a problem with the slides. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether there's um, anything much I can do about that, but I can certainly try to. I think I would have to then just give me a moment. Let's see if I can find them and put them up myself. I think Emma's having um, some internet issues. Uh, let me see if I can find the slides on this computer. I have them on a different computer. Okay, hold on a minute. Now I can share my screen, I think. So what side are you looking for? Oh, you're back. Excellent. Um, so, are you yeah, there? What side are you for? Sorry, I'm on, my I'm on slide number yeah. 16, which says uh, yeah. B, increasing delivery. We're back in the room by the looks of things. No, this one? Yeah, that's the one. That's um, my local Amazon delivery office uh, ruining all my parcels that I've been ordering. Um, so uh, this is the second prong of Poseidon's uh, Trident, increasing delivery. So not, not so much the supply of sites for planning permission to build houses on, but actually delivering uh, houses on those uh, sites. So reform to the new homes bonus, one assumes that that means more money for um, local authorities that can show that new homes have been delivered in their area. Again, that massive caveat here, a couple of uh, numbers. 1.1 billion for key schemes and 10 billion both in relation to delivering infrastructure dealing with the suggestion that sometimes a block to the delivery of new residential development is the lack of infrastructure and then another um, slightly cryptic phrase uh, the government would like to explore wider options to encourage planning permissions to be built out uh, more quickly now um, just a, a quick point about this um, uh, obviously, um, a lot of the response to COVID-19 has been um, worries about um, housing land supply generally, both delivery and um, supply. Uh, and there is a sort of ongoing debate about whether the answer is more sites with planning permission or help to ensure that the sites that already have planning permission for homes get built out. Um, I won't go into that now because that's a long 
and slightly nerdy chat, but it's it's definitely uh, there. I think we missed one uh, slide. Emma, could you just go back one slide to slide 17, if you're still here? I think you are. No, you can't go back with those things. Well, the, the previous slide just um, is, a, is a couple of points that most of you I know are aware of because you've asked, here we go, that you've asked questions about them. Um, the, the policy paper does what um, this government quite often does, which is announce things which have already been announced as if they were new things. So um, requirement that, again, pre-COVID, uh, local authorities have an up-to-date plan by 2023. Otherwise, they'll consider using the powers of intervention. Well, not much new there and they uh, promise in their policy paper to continue with the um, intention of increasing the housing delivery test threshold to 75% by November of this year. Now what that means I'm pretty sure, although the policy paper doesn't make it clear, that means the threshold below where if delivery falls below it then the tilted balance applies, not the threshold uh, about the application of the 20% buffer. That wouldn't be a raising, that would be a lowering. So given that it talks about raising, I'm sure they mean tilted balance. Now, both of those um, intervention, well, certainly the second intervention is all about uh, increasing the application sort of balance and therefore about more um, supply, but it's concerned with uh, d encouraging delivery, I suppose, uh, in that sense. Key point is uh, none of it's new. Um, and in answer to some of your questions, I think it's unlikely that the government will press on with that in November 2020 in the light of COVID-19, but you never know. It, it sort of depends on the outcome of the debate about whether more supply of sites is what we need or, or more interventions to encourage delivery on sites. Okay, uh, next slide, Emma, if you're still here. Um, want to demand, sorry, next one again, we've done that one, here we go. Um, so this is the other end of the pipeline, how many people want homes? There are two suggestions in the policy paper for this. Uh, the first homes scheme, which we know a bit about already, basically the first homes uh, scheme is a, a proposition of a 30% discount to first time buyers on the market price of a new build property, a discount which is then sort of baked into the price and passed on if they sell it. So if, that, if the first buyers buy it at a 30% discount, they then when they come to sell it, it gets independently valued and um, the, the, there is still a 30% discount to the new buyer. Um, idea is it encourages uh, people into onto the housing market who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford it, lower the cost of buying a home by an average of 70,000, but it's uh, 30%. Um, and, then, and then the national shared ownership uh, scheme a new national model for shared ownership will be more consumer friendly fairer and more accessible again i think this is slightly repackaging things that have already been uh, announced um, there was a question uh, again thanks about whether this first home scheme would undermine the help to buy scheme which is of course by and large um, shared ownership or equity loans well yes it yes it might but i think it's designed to just provide further stimulus for people to come in M my view is that um the main implication of COVID-19 is going to be depressed demand for new houses. People aren't selling, people aren't forming new households, so on and so forth. So there are going to have to be some fairly um, major interventions onto the demand side to keep things uh, rolling. Okay, um, next slide, uh, I think, is the slide that says hand over to Emma. I say that slightly nervously because Emma's been sort of dropping in and out, but hopefully yeah, I am here. I hope you he can hear me. Joe, it looks like you can hear me at least. I yeah, can. Yeah, my internet connection has been incredibly unstable. I keep getting disconnected. So I'm really hoping that at least for this segment, um, well, I'll stay online. Anyway, let's see how we go. So uh, moving towards zoning, the context of this um, in terms of planning for the future is that the uh, government is telling us that they want to expand the use of zoning tools to support development. This is under the heading um, speed up the planning system. So what is zoning? It's a land use planning technique used in many countries around the world. Essentially you've got two key elements. You have a zoning plan. You can see an example of that on the screen here which uh, identifies um, a number of different zones, splits a city or a district up into zones. 
uh, and then you've got the accompanying regulations, which is really where the meat of, of it is. And they specify what's allowed or not allowed in each of the zones, um, and then prescribes detailed rules on matters like density, height, green space requirements, and so on. Um, modern zoning regimes tend to be highly prescriptive. You can get regulations that run to hundreds or, or maybe even thousands of pages, so they're quite complex. So in terms of the, the pros and cons of that sort of system compared to what we have, as I just said, um, the, the zoning systems tend to be highly prescriptive, they're rule-based, so there's very little room for planning judgment there. That leads to, um, one would hope, more certain decisions because uses are defined as either acceptable or not acceptable in principle. The only question is whether the detailed rules and regulations are met. Whereas obviously in our system, developers commonly have to justify all aspects of their, of their proposals. So there's less to argue about really in a, in a zoning system. Um, the point about fixing land value is, it, it relates to the fact that everyone obviously knows what uses are and are not acceptable. So there's less scope for speculative land acquisition in that sort of system. The downsides um, really are, the inflexibility because it's rule based and prescriptive. Um, there's not much room for organic growth or responding to social change. So if if the zoning system leads to some sort of social problems or, or it turns out to be bad planning, that can become entrenched. And as I said, the, the, the regulations tend to be very long, so it's a very complex system. So have we adopted zoning in this country to date? Um, essentially, we haven't. It's not been a feature of our system, certainly not in its true sense. There are some planning tools that bear certain similarities. Um, I've listed those on this slide. Essentially, they're all um, ways in which the principle of a particular use can be predetermined as acceptable to some extent. Um, but unlike a true zoning system, none of those planning tools preclude other uses from being permitted in an appropriate case. So a site might be allocated in a development plan uh, for, for say residential use, but it would still be possible for a different type of use, a commercial use to come forward uh, and be granted permission on its merits, even if that's, that's unlikely at the moment at least. So um, in terms of moving towards zoning, Really, um, this all comes from the policy exchange paper that some of you might be familiar with, Rethinking the Planning System for the 21st Century. It was published um, on the 27th of January this year. Um, policy exchange are a highly influential think tank. Many members um, have gone on to be elected either as MPs uh, or government ministers or advisors. Um, and in fact, shortly after this report was published, the main author, Jack Airy, was appointed as a special advisor on housing and planning uh, to the Prime Minister. So it's well worth being aware of the thinking in this, which, which could be described as his manifesto, really, I suppose. Um, the ideas in this paper are pretty radical, um, involve a fundamental recasting of the planning system. Essentially, all land would be divided into two zones, either for development or not for development. There'd be no restrictions on the use of private land plots. So this would be in a very extreme, simplified form of zoning compared to the type of systems that I've been discussing earlier. Um, the theory with this would be that market forces essentially determine how land is going to be used. Um, and you'll see um, the last couple of points on the slide. The idea would be to redefine local plans so they're not general policies, but they would become essentially rules defining the form of development and then our applications would simply be a case of deciding whether those rules are met, an administrative process that wouldn't involve politicians at all. And I think Joe's going to come back to us at the end on one of the questions about whether we think that's likely to happen or not. So how does that feed through into planning for the future? Um, there's no indication at all that the government's going to go as far as the policy exchange report proposes. Um, those proposals, I think, are politically incendiary, especially the idea of removing local democracy. 
and there are obviously problems with the idea that the market will the right development in the right place. Um, having said that, the planning for the future does talk about a bold and ambitious white paper um, with creative solutions to set out a, a pathway to a new English planning system. So there's certainly it certainly leaves it open that there will be some more fundamental change, but but what that is will, will remain to be seen. Um, but for now, the policy paper confines developments towards zoning to essentially um, more use of local development orders. Um, talks about giving further support to local areas, perhaps introducing templates. I think that would maybe help to demystify the process for uh, local authorities who haven't made LGOs before. Um, and then fi financial incentives. Um, it's unclear what I think that would involve. In unclear whether they're meant to be incentives for councils to start making such orders or whether they're meant to be incentives for developers um, to start using them once they're in place. Um, if, for, if for developers then the incentives would presumably be in the form of some sort of tax break um, or maybe through tinkering with SIL. Uh, if the incentives are to be for local authorities you could be looking at things like the retention of uh, increased business rate receipts, which is what happened in the enterprise zones um, where LGOs were really initially used, um, or through perhaps our uplift the new homes bonus for, for residential development. Um, I think there's, a, there's definitely scope for increased awareness and use of local development orders, so the time is right for these to be looked at again. Um, by 2019, I think only, only 54 councils out of over 360 had actually made a local development order. Most of them were for um, commercial development, so there's definitely scope to expand their use to other types of development and to achieve um, different aims. And I should say the Local Government Association has published some really helpful case studies and guidance on this topic. And I should just also include a plug for our new Cornerstone Development Quarterly publication, which will hopefully be coming out in the next couple of weeks. Um, and there's going to be a, a short article on this topic in that. Um, I think even if we don't move to a, a zoning system, we may see more efforts to bring kind of rules into the system and try to reduce the scope for planning judgment, um, just to increase certainty. If there's less to argue about, there's, there's fewer appeals. So I think it's possible that the white paper might go a bit further in this direction than um, planning for the future indicates. Um, but we'll have to see just how far that is. So that's all I wanted to say about zoning. Um, moving on then to the topic of, of design, um, something that the uh, planning for the future policy paper says a little bit about under the heading creating beautiful sustainable places. The government wants to take action to encourage more beautiful design to ensure local authorities have the support they need to demand higher standards. So this section um, I think reflects in part work done by the Building Better Building Beautiful Commission, which I have to say probably one of the most terrible names that I've really heard in recent times. I'm going to call it 4B um, just because it's a complete mouthful. Essentially this, these on this side the details of what that commission was all about. Its purpose was essentially to tackle the problem of, of poor design uh, and the final report Living with Beauty was published in January of this year. The report contains um, 45 recommendations under eight different headings. Um, Ten of those are under the theme of planning, creating a level playing field. So I want to just focus on, on three of those uh, recommendations and then look to the policy paper and see how those might feed through. But the basic message was that design should be more fundamental than it currently is and should be embedded as a key aim of the planning system. So the first category of recommendations of the 4B report was changes to the MPPF. Uh, essentially beefing it up, adding more references to placemaking and creation of beautiful places. There was a specific recommendation about isolated homes in the countryside, um, but I think most interestingly a proposal to change paragraph 130 and essentially flip it around so that um, refusal, refusals wouldn't just be for poor design, 
uh, but for the absence of good design. So um, mediocre design um, would also be a basis for, for a refusal. Um, the report then talked about design codes, with quite a lot of um, support for uh, design codes in the 4B report. Um, support for the National Design Guide, which was published by the government in October last year, which is going to be functioning as a template for local authorities to develop their own codes. Um, support as well for form-based codes, essentially illustrated design rules on the physical development of an area. So um, looking at typologies of buildings, size and style of window openings, brickwork styles, that sort of thing um, was thought to be a good, a, a good thing. Um, and um, some specific proposals on permitted development rights. Um, and it was felt that those should perhaps be contingent on compliance with, with any design policy or code um, to tighten that up. But obviously that would be something that would require legislation. Uh, and then the final um, section, I suppose, of, of, of proposals that I wanted to look at was um, upstreaming, it, it, it's been referred to as, um, so setting out clearer expectations on design in local plans instead of general policies um, about supporting high quality design, the, the, the paper was suggesting that we should have much more detailed um, policies on what kind of design is expected. Um, I would like to just highlight the fast track for beauty um, that was uh, that was referred to. Um, that again, it's it's coming back to this idea of a more rule based system. I think um, the proposal was that a, a, the design policy or code would act as a set of rules for development, um, and then that would essentially allow the application stage to focus on compliance with 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 that policy so um, that that would set the details and the rules of what design was was going to be acceptable um, and then and then apply that when the application came forward um, the report also makes suggestions for the call for sites process and that being looked at um, more emphasis on holistic master planning from the outset rather than just reacting to sites um, that are emerging from that process but we don't know um, really the details of what that might look like. It's, it's something that needs to be reviewed, it tells us. So how does planning for the future respond? Um, I have to say fairly limited and vague response to this report, bearing in mind it was 190 pages long um, and contained 45 recommendations. Although I think it's fair to say some of those recommendations go beyond the planning system. Um, one participant, Beth, at Historic England asked to what extent the white paper would relate to the, the 4B report. I think it's fair to say we'll see more detail on design in that white paper. Um, perhaps on some of the proposals, I didn't go through them, but more on the strategic planning, um, plan making side of things, many of which seem sensible but aren't mentioned in planning for the future. Um, but it, planning for the future does tell us that the government proposes to take forward some of the changes to national policy not specific though as to which of those would be accepted or not. Um, so hopefully that would be covered in the white paper if, if not before then. Um, and then again, design codes, the government's confirming uh, that it wants to see increased use of design codes to set clear expectations. The national model design code, um, the, the competition to procure a consultant to help develop that actually closed on the 2nd of April. So that works underway. Um, so we can certainly expect to be seeing that probably not in the white paper, but maybe before then. Um, and then no specific mention of proposals, as I said, relating to local plans or use of local development orders, um, which were mentioned in the uh, 4B report. Um, but again, I think we can expect to see more about that in the white paper because there does seem to be this trend towards a more prescriptive approach. Um, but in general terms, looking at that policy paper, the focus very much remains on delivering homes as, as a central aim. It remains to be seen to what extent design concerns will, will trump that need in reality. So an example being um, the, the policy paper proposes to allow more upwards building under permitted development rights, as Joe was telling us. That's something that was specifically singled out by the 4B report 
which expressed concern about the blanket approach um, and no mention of the suggestion that permitted development rights should be contingent on compliance with design policy rules even and I'd, I'd be surprised if that if that did make its way forward into the white paper so um, that's what I want to say about design I'm going to finish off with the impact of coronavirus which essentially a large majority of the questions that we received in advance were variations on a the theme of um, when when is the white paper actually coming um, you know what are the impacts of COVID um, on delivery of all of this um, and essentially we are we'll go back a bit uh, we are in a different world now obviously compared to when planning for the future was published unbelievably only seven weeks ago but it feels like a lot longer ago than that um, in terms of the timing of, of any white paper um, that was originally earmarked for publication around July it was going to be published alongside the spending review it was going to be this comprehensive review of what does and doesn't work um, over the spring and summer um, in the lead up to that I think it's pretty obvious that that that's not going to happen now um, the spending review has been pushed back um, as I understand it to to probably coincide with the autumn budget which is likely to be in November so it's possible if the government does still intend to publish the white paper alongside the spending review it's possible that we'll see it in in no, around November of this year but as I say on the side it's a question of priorities whether um, with all the fallout of this um, this is going to be the public and the white paper is going to be top of the list I don't know it could be delayed um, for, a, for a, a much longer period than that um, but I think November is probably the next occasion for us to be looking out for something uh, and then finally in terms of money um, the uh, the proposals in planning for the, for the future add up to about 10.9 billion of new funding as I've set out on that side the, the vast majority of that was for the single housing infrastructure fund but there are various other measures um, and I think there's a real um, genuine question there over whether that kind of money is going to be spent now um, as a result of what the government has had to shell out in dealing with the coronavirus crisis. Um, I've just put some, some figures on the screen there about the budget deficit um, and that had got down to 1.8% of GDP prior to coronavirus. So that, that was about 39.4 billion that, that equates to. Um, compare that to um, just after the last financial crash when we were running a deficit of about 10%. At that time, GDP had fallen around 4.2%. So the OBR estimate um, for what the impact of all of this is going to be, and obviously it's all speculation, they're looking potentially at a fall in GDP of around 12.8% during this year. So significantly um, greater fall in GDP than after the last crash. And they think it's going to add approximately 220 billion to the budget deficit. So, I mean, we don't know. It's, it's, it's clear though that the deficit is going to increase dramatically due to combination of government measures to deal with coronavirus, but also potentially loss of tax revenue as well. Um, as to what the government response to that will be, we don't really know. Austerity was obviously supposed to be over, um, but I think what will be critical will be the speed to which, at which the economy recovers. Um, probably the policy changes, anything that doesn't involve spending large amounts of money um, might, might still survive, but one wonders about um, the promises on, on infrastructure funding and whether those are really going to materialise um, in the world that we're in now. So I think that takes us to the end of um, the presentation. We're going to have question and answers now. Um, and I'm just gonna have a quick look. Joe, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, sh shall, I, shall I start? I've got um, two or three. I, we, we should just start by saying that um, thank you very much everybody for submitting questions. We're not gonna be able to answer all of them because that would take, I think another 45 minutes to do that. And hopefully we've answered quite a lot of your questions um, in the course of what we've um, said. So if you asked a question and it was neither answered in our presentations or now, then apologies, but please feel free to 
email us and chase us and so on. But once we finish, there'll be a slide up with our email addresses and, and so on. Um, so I'm just going to deal with um, four little point. Well, they're not little points. One of them's quite a big point, but um, I'll deal with them relatively swiftly. So lots of you asked variations on a theme of what um, coronavirus was going to do to housing delivery and, and supply generally. Lots of references to the relatively recent Wokingham uh, Borough Council decision in which the inspector basically um, revised downwards the local authorities um, projections about delivery on sites uh, to take account of the effect of coronavirus, the, the basically the shutdown of building and so on and so forth. Um, I mean my, my view is that basically um, it's pretty clear that there's going to be a, a, a pretty major impact on delivery, at least in the short term, and much will depend on how long this slowdown or shutdown goes on. And I think there is some construction going on in the sun talk that might be one of the first industries to be released from the lockdown. Um, so, so long as social distancing can be maintained, but um, I do think most local authorities are going to have to take a pretty, robust look at their pre-COVID-19 projections for the next year um, in their five-year supply and have a think about whether they can really justify them anymore to try and head off a kind of working them revision downwards. Um, and I think, as I said, um, when I was speaking, the suggestion that the housing delivery test threshold might go up 75% uh, in November, I think that's doubtful. But as I said, there is, a, there is a debate going on about what the right response to the COVID-19 crisis in terms of house building is, uh, it's obviously a combination of more supply, more delivery, stimulating demand and so on and so forth. But um, another plug for our Cornerstone Development Quarterly, I've written an article, it's a fairly frothy uh, little article summarizing the um, likely impacts. I think that's coming out this week or, or next. So you can look out for that if, you, if you'd like to. And if you're not on our mailing list for that, then um, if you email Carolina, she'll she'll put you uh, on that um, and so there'll be a, a few more i mean they're not answers but a few more musings on uh, on that from from me in that publication um second question just a very quick one hello megan pashley who asked about is there anything in the policy paper about um the increasing issue of homes for the elderly i can answer that quickly no <laughs> there isn't um although clearly that's an issue um and it, it may be that the white paper says something about it but um I couldn't find anything in the policy paper of, of, of any of that nature. Um, next one about first homes and the help to buy. So I think I answered a couple of the questions about that, particularly how it might interact with how first the first home scheme might interact with the help to buy scheme, whether it would undermine it and so on and so forth. But there's been a follow up question from Matthew Thomas. Hello, uh, Matthew, um, about who absorbs the 30 percent discount and whether that has an effect on viability or might have. Um, so the, the answer is it, from the consultation on it, which you can have a look at on the internet, it looks as if it's expected that developers will basically be meeting the cost of that 30% discount as part of section 106 contributions. Uh, it may be that there's some help from the government fund too. That's the first purchase, but the way that the discount is baked in means that there's nothing to absorb or, or if you like, it's the buyer who absorbs the baked in 30% retained discount when they come to sell because they just can't sell it for market value. They can only sell it for 30% less. So it's only on the first delivery and first sale of the house that the 30% discount comes. And I think I'm afraid the answer is on the developer. The um, consultation says a few um, kind things about uh, not wanting this scheme to depress delivery or cause problems with viability but of course that's a case by case thing and again the impact of corona there may well be viability uh, concerns generally there may well be a general dropping off of house prices so an additional 30 percent discount may not be viable so those are all good good questions i don't know the answer to them but um the, the basic answer is i think the developer is going to have to pay uh, for those and then fourthly i promised i would come to um, one of the slightly more left field ideas in the policy exchange paper doesn't seem to have been picked up by the government that um, uh, elected members be removed from the planning process and we leave it all to planning officers. Um, I, I um, imagine that that has um, <laughs> stimulated some interesting debate amongst the planning community. Um, it doesn't seem that the government's very interested in that. I think it would be politically pretty difficult to 
um, to, to do it either way, either to remove officers or to remove members from the, from the process. And there's nothing in the policy paper that suggests that the government are into that or thinking about it. Um, but you never know because the person who wrote it is fairly close to government and um, we may hear something about that in due course. Um, so again, with apologies if I've mangled or not answered or insufficiently answered your very helpful questions. Um, those are the th three or four I was going to deal with. Emma, you've got a few, I think. So I'll hand over to you now. Yeah, thanks. Um, so Leila Cramphorn um, asked a question about how planning for the future or, or indeed the white paper um, will respond to climate change. Um, I think the answer to that is the response is pretty limited. Um, planning for the future mentions meeting the challenge of climate change when it's talking about what the planning system should do along with supporting beautiful design and building homes. Um, but the only concrete policy proposal um, relates to the future home standard. Um, and apparently that's going to require up to 80% lower carbon emissions for all new homes in 2025, which is described as an environmental revolution to home building. Um, and that's, that's really all um, that the policy paper had to say. Obviously, on the other hand, the Chancellor, I think the day before, had just announced 27 billion for 4,000 miles of new roads in the budget. So it doesn't necessarily send out the clearest sign that climate change is going to be a major priority at the moment. Um, so I think we just have to hope that the white paper does have a bit more than that to say on the subject. Um, and then Duncan Milne um, asked a question um, about uh, um, compulsory purchase order inquiries. Um, planning for the future suggests that um, the government will want to consult on removing the, automa uh, the automatic right to an inquiry. Um, and Duncan asked well, why, because numbers have reduced greatly in recent years. Uh, this proposal is in the, in the section on speeding up the planning system. Um, and essentially the government wants to reduce delays in land assembly and infrastructure delivery, which obviously in turn delay uh, the delivery of housing. Um, and sometimes a compulsory purchase order might be held up by a single objector or people um, might submit protective objections just to buy time because the timescales are tight which then triggers the need for an inquiry. So it, it could be um, just along those lines um, trying to kind of weed it out a bit. Um, but it, as we know, there's a general tend to trend to reduce inquiries and to save time and money. Um, so really, I think this is probably part of that. Um, then uh, Stephen Bainbridge asked a question about uh, what will be done about planning officers and their apparent readiness to, to look for problems rather than solutions. I don't think anything concrete, certainly there's nothing in planning for the future along, along those lines. Um, I think the, with the cost regime as we have, and, and Joe's already told us about the proposals for um, fee rebates and um, for successful appeals, I'm not sure that what, what much more can be, can be done about that. Um, but there's certainly no indication that any, any measures are coming forward along those lines. Um, and then finally, Matthew Thomas asked a question about um, uh, the MPPF and the design codes um, and whether there's any indication in a relaxation of the ability of local authorities to set out uh, local sustainability standards which go above and beyond building control and the short answer is no there's nothing there's no mention of that um, in planning for the future. Um, I would imagine given the emphasis on, on local design codes generally and, and that being something that the government's keen to increase the use of then there may well be more flexibility though coming forward in terms of what local authorities um, are able to achieve. So I think that deals with the questions that I wanted to respond to so I think that probably takes us to the end of the webinar. Um, so thanks everybody for joining us, sorry about some of the technical problems that we had um, but I hope that it was that it was useful and interesting um, and hopefully we'll see you again for another one soon. Thank you very much. Thanks Bye. very much everybody.